Hamish Maxwell Stewart is a professor of heritage and digital humanities at the University of New England. Hamish has authored many books and articles on comic transportation, the history of crime, and the health of past populations. His most recent book, published last year and co authored with Michael Quinlan, is titled Unfree Workers, Insubordination, and Resistance in Convict Australia, 1788 to 1860. Hamish specialises in the use of digital data to explore life course outcomes, and he has worked on a number of heritage site interpretations and other visualisation projects. Please welcome Hamish. I've taken this brief as a, 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 an opportunity to try and map out where we could, and I would argue should go, more broadly with history, but especially focusing on convict history, because I think that convict history has made much of the early ground in terms of using digital technologies and digitizing archival records. And I think that's interesting because that's also true elsewhere as well. So it's been historical demography and criminology which has broken ground um, internationally. And I think that speaks to the level of detail that you get in prison and criminal justice records. Um, in Australia, of course, the the other great digital project is in history is the prosecution project. So there's no, no, there's no accident that it's a criminal justice um, project which is forging the way with convict history. So what I've tried to do is to map out four areas where I think um, we need to concentrate on in order to make big breakthroughs in convict history and also in the wider humanities. The first is record linkage. It's always record linkage. It's been record linkage right from the start of history. This is how you turn static records into animated records. It's how you analyze life courses. Without putting records together, you can't do that. And I think something that's very important is that without really um, clever record linkage, smart record linkage, you're left with a record of failure. Because that was the job of the convict archive. It was to document failure. It's to filling in the gaps allows you to see the other side of the convict story. And so often it's the, it's the gap, it's the convict that has very little on that, their records, which is actually the most interesting. So this means linking to other record series, especially births, deaths, and marriages. And of course, this is the, the only way of actually um, driving intergenerational analysis. And this is the great contribution that history can make to the history of health, uh, particularly in an era where we know things like um, um, the, fe um, the, the uh, fetal programming and gene environment interactions are in play. We, we, we have evidence that they, they are powerful factors, we just do not know how they play out across um, multiple generations. And of course, as several speakers have said before, the ability to place one life course outcome in the context of all is just critical for biography. There are loads of technologies that will allow us to do this. Um, I'm really looking forward to the next few years when we will be able to take huge amounts of the Trove archive and connect it to digitized record series. It's quite possible to do that. But in order to do that, we need something really important. We need a common set of identifiers. Yeah. That's just critical. Um, we need coding dictionaries. Um, we need to adopt um, something very boringly called the IDS, the Intermediate Data Structure. This was developed by the historical demographers in Europe and North America. Um, we also can call it people, events, context. That so every single historical record contains and been broken down into those three things. And relating those three things together is the way to build any single life but also multiple lives. Uh, we also need, as Janet has already indicated, better ways of connecting with the family history, fantastic volunteer community out there, and um, providing user support to the archive. Because the archive is not neutral, as I've already indicated. It's a bureaucratic tool. These are technologies of government. And you can't just go finding records out there and expecting the records to tell you the past. They need to be put into context. I think the next big breakthrough is in mapping. Um, it's really great that Richard Tuffin um, is here. 
um, mapping with Richard has just been, and I'll show you some, some um, illustrations of some of the stuff we've done recently. Mapping allows you to explore really important things. Urban-rural differences. Um, we forget how many convicts were deployed in urban areas. So in the case of Van Diemen's Land, nearly two-thirds of all female convicts at any single point in time were in a town, not in the countryside. And so that's one of the reasons why their experience is so different, is because they're so urban-based. Um, death rates, punishment and protest rates across sites, they, they, they vary enormously. Um, we have a PhD student working on service in penal stations. It cuts life expectancy by about five years. Um, institutional constraints. What are the number of cells available to a magistrate in any particular location, and does that influence sentencing strategy? And I think um, very important here is to lead the way in creating the next generation of heritage management tools. So it makes the data that we generate useful in other contexts beyond history. Uh, that's important because it gives what we do a financial underpinning. I'll talk more about that. Again, the tools are here, historical ge uh, geographical information systems and LIDAR. Um, what critically do we need to do? I think we need to pile into the gazetteer of historical Australian place names and time-led culture maps and make sure that there is a standard way of identifying places, historical places, across Australia. Because apart from anything, one and two play out together. Space is critical in record linkage. It's, a, it's a, one of the most, um, uh, or it's one of the easiest ways to link two lives is if you find events that happen in one specific location. The third is network analysis. One of the things that um, I think is really important to try and establish it is how convicts redeveloped their kinship networks that have been split asunder by transportation. What is the relationship between the witnesses that signed marriage certificates and the groom and the, spouse, uh, and, and the bride? Um, what can network analysis tell us about class relations? Who forms trade unions, joins churches, and other societies? And again, the tools to do this are all there. And I think the exciting infrastructure that we need is all around visualization. So networks look terrible when you see them on a screen. So what is the best way that we can find of visualizing the results of network analysis? And then that leads on to my final point, which is not really a technology. It's just we need much, much better training and engagement. We need better training for undergraduate history students and postgraduates. Um, and I think we're at a really, really important point here. Um, Frank and I were in a, um, an AHA session um, about um, chat GPT and teaching. And I think one of the really interesting things that was said there is that you can use chat GPT to cut Python, the Python learning curve. Just, you know, it's now possible to teach history undergraduate students to program. We should grab that opportunity. Um, this is also a way of um, speeding up transcription. Janet talked about this. Um, um, uh, AI is now at a point where you can do this. We're doing it with Tasmanian 20th century death certificates. And so take a, scan them, and then you use um, something called ICR to automatically transcribe them. You still need to get a transcriber to go over them, but it, it massively um, shortens the process. Um, and I think that this can also play out a huge role. AI can play out a huge role in helping us to mark up um, semi-structured and unstructured text. So this is diaries, um, government accounts, etc., etc., and attach it to all of the structured records that we've got, the convict index, the births, deaths, and marriages. And what that will do is it will enroll the enthusiasts and um, convert the doubters, the people who haven't jumped on board digital history because they think it's too much about quantitative history. Um, these will be, this, the technology will allow every historian to benefit from the new digital archive. Um, and there are all kinds of things that we can do there, which I think the most exciting is the idea of digital wallpaper is coming. And so we're working with um, a pub in Hobart to explore the possibility of them being LED screens along the wall that look like wallpaper, but then turn into history. And so interactive history playing out in public spaces. What does all this look like? Well, it looks quite boring. This is the um, one page from the Digital History Tasmania um, database. Digital History Tasmania is um, a not-for-profit company um, formed to join the family historians, academic historians, 
and um, archivists and librarians who are interested in Tasmanian data together. Um, what's remarkable about this seemingly boring page is it contains, or the, this database contains 421,000 life courses. For people who lived in Tasmania prior to 1920, there's 78,000 convict lives in here. There's um, the Port Phillip exiles and quite a lot of Norfolk Island convicts are in there. And there are 2.25 million digitized records. Um, this thing is like a giant rabbit warren. Um, so we can follow an individual, in this case, William um, Caldecott Cowley, and then you can look at all of their relationships, significant relationships, and then you can pick on any one of those and you can follow that person, and indeed then you can look at their relationships too, which allows you to build generations. So this is a tool that we put together in order to, um, um, to um, improve record linkage between the generations in Tasmania. So we can dive into this. So that's all about people. Let's um, look a little bit quick, no, very quickly at events. So this is a, an admission um, record for Anne Delaney, um, a convict. Oh, if we can get it to go, that's a, a hospital admission. And here we have a pass holder contract that's signed um, by her. And um, I can give these to Monica Schwartz from Sensi Lab at Monash University, and she can generate a life course. Uh, for that woman in a nanosecond. In fact, she's written an R script, which in you know, a split second will develop a, a, um, a life script for any um, convict. And here you can see that births, deaths, and marriages have been joined together. So you can see the convict offences um, in tune or in alignment with other records. We can also look at context. So that this convict signed um, a contract to work with um, a, a master in Liverpool Street. Here is Liverpool Street. Um, Richard Tuffin has digitised the 1847, or the, the maps of Hobart that were developed between 1841 and 46. Um, we've linked them um, to a variety of different records. Now, this is not just a map sheet now. Every building is a shapefile, so other data can be attached to it. Every lot or property is also a shapefile because there may be more than one buildings on a lot. Every street is a shapefile, every block. So Trove newspaper articles can be attached now to the streets that they relate to. Um, even the Hobart Town Rivulet has become a shapefile, so we can attach data to that. Um, and then we can, um, I, I like to say this is giving the archive a floor plan, um, then we can link all kinds of records for Hobart for 1847 to this. So these are the valuation rolls, births, deaths and marriages, the street directory, the surviving manuscript censuses, there are some for Tasmania, um, and we can look at what happens to former convicts, who becomes a householder, who becomes a property owner, who doesn't. Um, what is really interesting is who is not in different records, appears in one but not in another. So just very quickly, um, this is that same block um, linked to the street directory which tells you the trades all the way across Hobart. So we know where all the butchers are, all the tailors, all the solicitors, etc., etc. So we can now start linking convict offences to this townscape. Um, just to very quickly take you through um, one former convict, George Platt, his butcher. There's his census record. So this is yet, yet another one of these male convicts living in a household with no women. So we've got two um, other male convicts in there, both assigned servants. We know who they are because we can look at the pass holder contracts for that property. And sure enough, they're butchers. And in fact, in some cases, we know their bank account details because we've got the Hobart Savings bank account. And believe it or not, we know the temperature and barometer readings on the day that the contracts were signed because we have that daily data too. Um, so we can do you know, the kind of um, output stuff that Janet was doing earlier. So this is um, a regression for wages. And you know, just really, really quickly, you can, that's the mean wage. So we can see uh, what effect being employed in different regions has. Um, look at um, the penalty for being um, a woman. Um, look at the um, age penalties as well, the teenagers are disadvantaged, which is something that's coming across very strongly in our data sets. Uh, then we can um, look at ethnicity and also um, the effect that skill and uh, butcher is in that food and drink category down, down there. So we can do all of this kind of stuff. We can also do some uh, really interesting visualisation. Again, this is Monica. This is 23,000 convict absconding notices and animated. 
over time. But you can click into any one of these and find the location. Everybody else absconded from that. So we, uh, Michael Quinlan and I used this um, to pinpoint um, areas where convicts were literally voting with their feet and running from those locations. Um, so what are we trying to achieve with this? And I think that what we're doing is the archaeology of the archives. So we're stripping records, digitizing complete count records, everything that's there, and joining them one to one. So this is like different layers, archaeological layers. And you know, what I would argue that does is it gives the archive a stratigraphy that it didn't have before. And one of the exciting things is you can literally find the people that are not in the records, because they're not in the records. Mm -hmm. That tells you something. Mm -hmm. um, and so an, an illustration of this, if you have all registered births and you compare, for example, Catholic baptisms in an area, you can see the unregistered. So the, uh, you know, being able to do that is actually, I think, really, really important. It tells you something about those families who decided to register their child with the Catholic Church but not with the state. It puts them into a category. And then you know, we can do this with, you know, with, with, a, with a convict. But you know, we need to put that household within the context of what is there. I call this building the frame of the nation. You know, and again, I think convict, convict history is um, doing the pioneering work here. Um, in a very influential book, Anne Laura Stola um, um, pleaded for, with historians to read the archive along its grain. And I think that's what we're doing. That's the kind of work that, um, that Janet outlined earlier, is um, putting the records back together, vast archaeological project, in order to read the archive along its grain, to work out its biases, work out what's missing. But if we do that, we do something really important. So the archivists that I work with tell me that um, a document doesn't become a record until an archival description is attached to it. And what we're doing is imaging r records transcribing them, uh, then getting, uh, cleaning the transcripts, forming coding dictionaries, coding them, and then attaching those back to the archival prescription. So we're providing a much, much better way back into the archive. And those contextual tools, which help you read the archive as well. And we might describe this as enriching the provenance of the nation. It's all kind of good words which help you get funding for doing stuff which is going to leave a legacy. Um, and my final point is that we have to make this sustainable. Um, um, reiterate something that Janet, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be expanding a little bit on something that Janet showed you a glimpse of, but the use of AI now to make the past available to the general public in ways that haven't been made, um, haven't been possible before, um, and in a way which is controlled by us, which is kind of interesting. So one of the, the last things I want to do is to wrap the past up in a chocolate box. You know, I want Tasmania's past to be interpreted in ways that are gritty and grainy. So here we have one of the few photographs of a convict taken shortly after they became free. This is Linus Miller, um, transported for the outrageous crime of invading Canada. Uh, here we have um, the front, frontispiece from his book, and now it's possible to do this. The people of England are told that their fallen countrymen are sent here to be saved from their evil ways, to be restored to this world and their happiness secured for the next. But alas, there are no roads from Van Diemen's land to heaven, while there are thousands that lead to the regions of eternal death. And I think doing that kind of stuff is increasingly important because it's a way of uh, driving an income stream that goes back into maintaining the data sets. Archiving data is great, but there are problems with using archived data sets. Um, because data, historical data, is messy, the best way to keep it alive is to keep it in a curated collection which people are working on. Um, that's certainly our digital history Tasmania's plan for the Tasmanian Convict data sets. Thank you very much.